My job is to dissect out why LDL cholesterol goes up on a low-carb diet, and also to find out and create a narrative if that is necessarily bad. And you'd be shocked to hear that I really have no disclosures. <laughs> so I didn't know whether I should include this slide at the end or in the beginning, but I thought it would have more impact in the beginning. Because there are people right, sitting right in front of me that medical knowledge is no longer the monopoly of physicians or healthcare professionals. And there are a lot of citizen scientists who have more insight because they can think outside the box. And my transformation came because my patient's grassroots effort told me that, hey, I needed to change. And unless organizations and physicians higher up heed this warning, I feel that if we don't bring the change from top down, we're going to get buggy whipped. <laughs> so for the last five years, I've been telling my patients, hey, eat like this. Animal fat, fatty meat, and fatty fish. And in my clinical experience, this is what I find. When people take this to heart and practice it religiously, three good things happen out here. Their HDL goes up, their triglyceride comes down, their insulin goes down, and everybody agrees that this is beneficial, but the darn LDL that everybody is worried about goes up, especially when one is being particularly good at it. So before we demonize LDL or cholesterol, we got to recognize that it's an evolutionary important molecule, important for life. The, every cell in our body, the cell membrane, would not have the fluidity and integrity if it were not for cholesterol. On the right of the slide is the brain membrane, and the structure of the brain membrane is, is permitted to be the way it is, and neurotransmission happens because of cholesterol rafts that give the brain membrane the structural in integrity that it needs. In fact, the cholesterol is so important for the brain that it does not delegate that responsibility to any other organ but itself. Now, I would not be able to stand here and give this presentation without the LDL cholesterol, which is much maligned, because that LDL cholesterol is supplying cholesterol to my adrenal cortex, giving me the stress hormone cortisol so that I can deal with the stress. The LDL molecule that cardiologists want to wipe from the face of the earth is giving cholesterol to the ovaries, making all women in here look beautiful, and testosterone to men, making us look handsome. Now, bile acids are absolutely essential for absorbing fat-soluble vitamins, for absorbing fats, and they are cholesterol byproducts. And cholesterol is not a metabolic fuel. We cannot use it for energy. So bile acids constitute the way in which we eliminate cholesterol in our gut. Vitamin D is a cholesterol product. Now, both cholesterol and triglycerides are fat, and they don't dissolve in blood because blood is watery. So our body has created an ingenious system to carry this cholesterol, as other speakers have mentioned. There's an outer cover of phospholipids that makes the molecule dissolvable in water, and the cargo is cholesterol with an identifying protein that is shown out there. Now, on the right side of the slides, I have shown many beneficial functions of LDL cholesterol, and I would be, not be able to get into them, but people watching this later can pause and peruse them. So I wanted to find out why LDL goes up, and this paper gave me a big insight. Now, this paper is in seven people who fasted for seven days, and what was found is that fasting increased their LDL cholesterol. Now, you would think that fasting is beneficial. The LDL cholesterol started at 112, ended up at 119 seven days, a whopping 70% increase. Fasting makes us do fat metabolism. So I had to go back all the way into the 1950s to the work of George Cahill and come up with this graph on the right. And the reason I have put that up there is because we have very limited carbohydrate reserves. When we stop eating or eating a low-carb diet, what happens is that we run out of glycogen very quickly within the first four to eight hours. 
And then you see that for certain tissues that need sugar, you see that the gluconeogenesis is slowly going up and then comes down. And the reason it comes down is because our body becomes adapted to burning fat as ketones. So out here is shown that with prolonged fasting, which is an extreme example of a low-carb diet, what you're seeing is that the ketone levels go up to five millimoles, which is equimolar to our blood sugar concentration. So what are these amazing ketone molecules? Out here is shown on the left of the screen a person who's on a standard American diet who's burning predominantly sugar in his brain. But when you're on low-carb diet or doing fasting, the brain adapts and turns two-thirds of its use to ketones, showing that it becomes fat-adapted. I'd like to take exception with Dr. Muzaffarian yesterday because he said that we are extreme examples. We are going too far. We want ketosis. Low carb is enough. I'd like to remind him that man's entry into life and the reason that we are still alive is because we are capable of ketosis. In fact, I'd like your indulgence to read this word for word, which says the metabolism of human new newborn is essentially ketotic. Blood glucose level falls strikingly in the neonate and concentrations of beta-hydroxybutyrate rise to about two to three millimoles. The newborn brain consumes 60 to 70% of total metabolism at birth, nearly half from beta-hydroxybutyrate. Fitting in with this pattern is maternal colostrum. It contains much triglycerides, proteins, and very little lactose, starting man entry into society on an Atkins diet. <laughs> So here is a liver cell, and I'd like to thank all the speakers ahead of me to making it easy for me. Since you're not eating carbs, you're fasting. The carbs are reserved for the brain. The liver cell is converting fat into ketones. And this is the Ali model as to why the cholesterol is going up, and I have never shared this data in front of a national audience before. The enzymatic machinery that's making ketones in us involves HMG-CoA, which is a branch point, at which point it gets diverted to making either ketones, but it can also make cholesterol. This figure is a little bit more elegant for people who want to see the molecular structure of these molecules, but you can see that as fatty acid is entering the liver, it's getting converted to acetyl-CoA, then becomes HMG-CoA, which is the branch point that makes either ketones or makes cholesterol. So by design, if you get very good at fat burning, like the lean mass hyperresponder that Dave Feldman has so nicely put out, by design, you're going to increase your cholesterol levels. So here is a little animation. The liver is synthesizing a lot of cholesterol in somebody who's predominantly fat burning. And if you follow my Twitter feed, I have put in all kinds of animal as well as human studies that show this. And as it is making more LDL cholesterol, it's also eliminating cholesterol in bile and through the gut. The terminal, terminal ileum is the one that reabsorbs the bile, but less of it is reabsorbed, so more of it gets out in the feces. So by design, since the liver is synthesizing more cholesterol, it's going to produce more LDL. It's also going to produce more bile for elimination. Now, it was pointed out that the oxidized LDL is the culprit. The oxidized LDL gets taken up by the macrophage through the scavenger receptor. And there are human studies and animal studies that show that in a person on a low-carb diet, the elimination of this scavenger receptor filled macrophage is much greater in the feces in a low-carb individual. Now, this is another point that I was shocked about. The liver is making a lot of cholesterol, and so it is not going to take any of the LDL back into it because it doesn't need it. There are human and animal studies that show that there is LDL receptor downregulation. These are the receptors that are picking up the LDL and removing it from circulation, but since the liver already has the cholesterol that it needs, it downregulates them. 
Now, this is a little geeky slide. It's just put in for the people who really want to see it. And this is a fasting study in humans. And these people were not on a low-carb diet. The fasting was not any prolonged. But you can clearly demonstrate out here that in a fasted state, the liver is making much less VLDL cholesterol, which is triglyceride-rich, and making a lot higher LDL cholesterol, which is cholesterol-rich. So I said that I wanted my patients to eat like this, fatty food, fatty uh, uh, animal fat, animal uh, protein, which is fatty, as well as fatty fish. When they do this, this is the pattern that I observe. If they are ketotic, if they are having ketones, by design, they're going to have high LDL cholesterol. They're going to have high HDL. And studies show that they eliminate more fecal cholesterol, and their LDL receptor goes down. So now I move on to a path which says, why do we malign LDL? Does it have any benefit? So this is a rat lung, and in the rat lung are these bacteria. And the bacteria want to cause an infection in the rat. And what is happening out here is that it releases this protein, which is called AGR protein, which establishes a quorum and says, hey, there is enough uh, milieu out here for us to cause bacterial virulence, and they take foothold and cause a pneumonia. Now, you would be surprised to know that there are animal studies that show that the lowly LDL is the one that soaks up this AGR protein so that quorum is not established and infection is abolished. Now, here is another uh, bit of information, and that is that these bacteria also release inflammatory mediators. And these inflammatory mediators cause cell death. What is neutralizing these inflammatory mediators, which is LPS and LTA? It is same, the LDL cholesterol. And it reduces bacterial virulence. Now, what about human studies? I want to go to some prospective human studies. This is the Leiden 85 study. 700 patients followed for 10 years. And they looked at whether cholesterol predicted their mortality, their cancer death, and their infection. And what we found is that high cholesterol was defined as 300 or greater, 250 was middle cholesterol, and 200 was low cholesterol. The highest cholesterol group had the lowest overall mortality. The highest cholesterol group had the lowest overall cancer mortality. Old people die of infections, pneumonias. The least risk of infection was in the highest cholesterol group. Now, I told you that brain integrity is dependent on cholesterol rats for neurotransmission. Now, this is a Lothian birth cohort. Kids born in 1936 in the town, followed in 2010 when they were 70 years of age. And the principal reason that they were being followed is to see whether cholesterol predicted cognitive function. This is what happened. 300 was high cholesterol, 250 was middle cholesterol, and 200 was low cholesterol. The highest cholesterol group had the lowest risks of hypertension, the lowest risks of stroke, the lowest risks of heart disease. What about cognitive function? The higher your cholesterol, the better your cognitive function. The general ability, your processing speed, your memory, your IQ, all dependent on high cholesterol. About 300 of these 1,000 patients were on statins. Did statin make a difference in their cognitive skills? And what we find is that the 300 people that were on statins, their cognitive skills was much lower compared to their cohort that were not on statins. So this is what the standard American diet is. Unfortunately, nobody in this audience eats it. It's got the trifecta of grains, added sugar, and plant oils. And what it does is that it causes insulin resistance and all, causes all the things that we have heard about. But the way I want to summarize is what is the optimal diet? Whether you believe the expensive tissue hypothesis or no, we all recognize that we have enormous energy expensive brains. And the primary focus of our digestion is the small intestine, which is designed to absorb high-quality nutrients without processing them. 
and we have rudimentary fermentation capacity, as Zoe pointed out. In addition, we have an acid-based digestion. We have a monogastric stomach that makes acid. That's absolutely essential for protein digestion. And if we dilute that acid with fiber, or fiber binds with minerals, you're not going to absorb the protein. In addition, our pancreas, we are, we are bestowed with a pretty bad pancreas because it cannot handle the glycemic load or the glycemic index, and that's why it dies so quickly. Now, I'm not going to go through this graph. I put it up for people to peruse it later, but here are my arguments as to why animal-sourced food, predominantly low-carb animal-sourced food, is better than whole food, plant-based diet. Because if you're on a whole food, plant-based diet, by design, you're going to eat a lot of fiber in order to reduce the glycemic index. And if you're going to do that, you're going to need a large amount of time in the day to eat it to supply your brain with calories. I would not be able to prepare this talk. You would not be able to socialize. And the practitioners of this, like Zoe pointed out, are going to spend a lot of time in the bathroom. So I want you to start eating like this. And when you start eating like this, this is what you're going to notice a high HDL, low triglycerides, low insulin, and a higher LDL. And this is my conclusion slide, which says that, should we celebrate a high LDL rather than moan it? Especially since most people in these will meet these three criteria. They'll have a higher LDL, they'll have a lower triglyceride, they'll have lower insulin levels. Because I'd like to submit to you that this is gonna make you live longer, have better cognitive skills, lower infection rate, and lower cancer risk. So I really thank you for giving me the opportunity to present here.